Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find all the old shows and find a link to subscribe with your favorite podcatcher or iTunes at uh, www.rce-cast.com. I also have here Jeff Squires, one of the authors of the newly released MPI, OpenMPI 1.6. So, yeah, we just released uh, OpenMPI 1.6. Uh, very excited about that. Finally took that one to the stable series, and we're encouraging everybody to upgrade. So go look at OpenMPI.org and the, the announcements and uh, free code and all those kinds of things. But the other thing I'm kind of excited about is uh, just got uh, a book chapter published about the internals of OpenMPI in a book called The, uh, the Architecture of Open Source Applications, Volume 2. And um, it's actually all the proceeds go to charity. They go to Amnesty International. So not getting a dime for it. It was just kind of an open source thing to do to talk about how your software works and uh, release that out into the world. And so go Google that and you'll find it. And it's, uh, it's good stuff. There's a lot of other applications, well-known open source apps in there, like Apache and Git and uh, Hadoop file system and things like that. It's a great learning resource just to go see how other people, other successful open source projects have architected their software. It's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, that is pretty neat. So uh, we're actually doing something a little bit different. We're doing more like a panel discussion. So today we're going to be talking about uh, HPC resource allocations. We're going to stick to like your compute nodes. We want to talk to three different uh, organizations about the different ways that they allocate out their compute cycles, either be it condos or allocations or something in the middle. Uh, and so who we have with us today, um, we have representing the University of Michigan, we have Andy Caird, who I should also point out is my boss. Uh, we have Brian Gulfos from Ohio Supercomputing Center, and then we have Preston Smith from Purdue. So Andy, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Andy Caird. Uh, as Brock mentioned, I'm at the University of Michigan, and I am the uh, director of high performance computing for the College of Engineering here at the University of Michigan. And I've been doing the stuff with Brock and a few other folks for uh, about eight years now. And we've uh, we've recently, in the past couple of years, moved from a pretty explicit condo model to uh, a, something closer to an allocation model, although it's not very pure in the sense of uh, what I think Brian will talk about. So uh, that's kind of what we're doing, and we're we'll, looking forward to hearing what everybody else has to say. Brian? Yeah, my name is Brian Gilfus. I uh, work at the Ohio Supercomputer Center where I manage our client services. Um, I've been doing this job here for about eight or ten months now. Uh, I've been at the center for almost seven years. Uh, before that, I was a defense contractor at Wright Pat Air Force Base uh, doing uh, human interface research uh, for UAV control. Uh, so it's a little bit different than the HPC stuff, but uh, we do uh, primarily uh, allocations-based uh, scheduling, uh, and, and we're uh, uh, exploring some other opportunities. So I'm, I'm interested in seeing uh, what everybody else is doing and, and hearing what, uh, what's worked for them. Okay, and lastly but not least, Preston. Yeah, uh, my name is Preston Smith. I'm the manager of the research support team at Purdue University in the Rosen Center for Advanced Computing. Um, the Rosen Center is a unit of, of what we call ITAP, Information Technology at Purdue. It's the central IT organization at Purdue. And we, we uh, build and allocate our, our HPC resources through a uh, condo or community cluster model. Okay, so how about you guys go ahead and give us a little bit, um, you each mentioned the kind of allocation model you have, but could you go into a little bit of depth of what that is and kind of description of your resources? Sure, I'll just go in order, I guess, again. Um, so we have uh, we have a couple of things here at Michigan, but what I'm going to talk about mostly is what we call FLUX, uh, F-L-U-X. Uh, the name was to indicate uh, sort of the lines of FLUX to attract people to the system. Uh, I'm not sure if, if that was accurate in the end, but that's what we have. Um, and the allocation model was intended to take people who are very used to a condo model, so they have this idea of, I have this many boxes and they are mine, um, and move them with that same kind of restriction, right? If you buy a computer from HP or Dell or IBM or whomever, you get, say, 12 cores and that's all you get. You cannot then later get more in that same box. So our, our idea was we would give them that constraint at sort of the top end, but we'd let them pick arbitrary integers and we would make allocations uh, with that one 
uh, limit of cores, and then the other limit, of course, is time. So we have kind of this two-dimensional thing of cores and time. Uh, and that's what they get charged for, kind of whether they use it or not. So in a sense, it's more like a hardware purchase in that way. If you buy a computer from Dell and you don't ever use it, you don't get money back from Dell, of course. Uh, so we, we wanted to hew to that as best we could, at least at the beginning. Uh, and we still consider ourselves, after two years, to be at the beginning. So our model uh, pretty much tries to look like hardware. That said, from the operator's standpoint, we can oversubscribe it, uh, which we do. And as such, the, the price everybody pays comes down. So hopefully we're, we're more competitive in that way because of the oversubscription. And because in our condo model, over a decade or so of operating that, we noticed the utilization was fairly low, um, 50% or so. So we, um, we thought, boy, we could oversubscribe by a factor of two, and it would work out, and everyone would pay half as much. In reality, that doesn't actually work out. But we do oversubscribe by a, by a bit, um, one 0.5-ish or so, one point, it depends. We haven't really figured that out yet, but uh, in any case, it's more than a factor of one, which is better than a piece of hardware, and uh, hopefully we're, we're reflecting that in the costs to everybody who uses it um, without too much violence being done to their view of what a computer is for them. Um, that's, that's kind of what we do here. So just curious, why doesn't an oversubscription factor of, of two work out? Is there bursty issues that you have to deal with or something else? It is. It's the it's the bursty issues, um, pretty much. Because of course, if we, I think if we had more computers, right? So we've only ever reached that point once, and we had two thousand cores. Uh, we've been expanding it. We're now at six thousand cores, and and I think we'll get to uh, eight thousand pretty soon this summer, maybe even ten this summer. Um, and I think with more cores, we'd have more jobs starting and ending at any given time. And then we could increase the oversubscription, and people would see less of a delay. Um, again, we're trying to keep it feeling like your own hardware, right? So we kind of want it to be responsive. Um, you know, within at least minutes or maybe small numbers of hours, but certainly not large numbers of hours or days for a job to start. So, um, but yeah, we, we we tried it up to two, and it didn't uh, it didn't work out. Nobody was very happy with that. Um, so, but we do think that sort of, you know, 1.7 or 1.8 is probably going to work. Um, we haven't gotten back up there yet with the additional hardware. So right now, everybody's pretty happy with it. Okay. Brian, could you describe what you guys do? Yeah, we uh, we have fairly uh, uh, homogeneous uh, uh, setup here. Um, we have a, a just actually just earlier this year, we brought online our newest cluster, Oakley, uh, 106 uh, teraflops. You know, 832 cores, uh, almost or nodes, almost a, uh, 10,000 cores, and um, for us, we we basically we hand out uh, what we call resource units, which are uh, one resource unit is currently uh, 10 CPU hours, uh, and we hand out you know we get 5,000 just kind of right off the bat for asking, uh, <laughs> just hey I want to use the system. Um, and if you need more than that, we actually require uh, grant proposals to be submitted, and then those are peer-reviewed uh, and an allocation committee that is made up of uh, from our user community, uh, basically, will will review those for scientific merit. Um, you know, is the RU request reasonable? Uh, are you asking for a reasonable amount of resources uh, to do the, the work that you want to do? And then they kind of dole those out. Uh, and then we, we, you know, scheduling is then fairly straightforward. You just use you know, burn your your time burn through your RUs. Uh, so it's all it's all very straightforward in terms of of, of the resource allocation. Um, you know it becomes a little bit more difficult uh, when we start dealing with with special cases, uh, especially large users or, or issues like that. Okay, that's a good overview. Let's go with that for the moment. Preston, how about you? So at, um, at at Purdue we operate in um, in a condo model. We we use community instead of instead of condo, but it's it, it's essentially the same the same meaning of the of of the of the word. Um, we every year, usually about in springtime, we'll put out a call to our faculty that we're building another cluster. Um, we'll work with a number of different vendors to get get bids on the cluster. Uh, we do this every year so the faculty can plan no matter no matter when their grants may be coming due or when somebody's maybe starting at the university they can plan that either their startup money or their grant funds there's always going to be some place to invest in computing 
Um, so we, we centrally provide all the system administration, software installation, um, consultant support, and all that sort of stuff use central data center space, central networking and storage. So that all of the faculty have to do is, is pay money in for the, for the cost of the node. Um, so they know if I buy 116 uh, core nodes that I get that many cores um, with, with, to, to choose from for my research group. Um, the, the, the slightly odd part is that we're kind of a, kind of a hybrid these days with um, rather than physically buying nodes for the faculty, they're, they're, they're buying what appears to be a service. So they, they couldn't walk into the machine room and look and look at um, look at the racks and say, that is my node right there. But they know they at least have that, that much capacity uh, that, they, that they've invested in. Okay, so let me get that straight. I, I, I didn't quite catch all that. So the, you're saying that, that faculty play a, a flat fee. How do they determine how much each faculty member is? Is it weighted or do, or do they get the, uh, is it uh, the same fee for everybody or how does that work? I'm sorry, I just kind of missed it, that. It, it, it's, a, it's a flat fee per node. Um, so it, it's essentially the cost I of the see. node. So th this year, we, um, the, the machine I'm going to refer to for most of my questions is a machine called Carter, which we just brought into production last month. Um, its, its nodes cost $3,300, so a faculty member could buy in with $3,300, get one node, and it can, then you, can, can then start using the cluster. Um, so the, all they have to pay is that $3,300, they get access to their cluster for its entire five-year life. And um, and then they just go on from there. They don't have to pay any of the the the, um, the hidden costs for the networking, the power, the storage. Or okay. So do they get they get access to one node for the life of that cluster at any given time? Is that what you mean? Correct. So if I buy one node okay. at thirty three hundred dollars, I get a sixteen a sixteen processor queue, and I can use that however I need. And then, you know, g going on upwards for as many nodes as, as somebody wants to buy in for. So I have, I have a question about what do you. How do you see, what do you do with unused capacity? What if I buy a node and never use it? Does it just sit there in the data center? Well, it, it, um, it would normally, but we have, we've come up with a, with a way of letting, letting all the other faculty that are members of the cluster um, use everybody else's nodes when they're idle. Um, in early versions of the community cluster program, we used to use um, a preemptible queue. Um, that, that didn't turn out to be very popular. Uh, it's kind of non-deterministic if, you know, if you never really know when your job might get preempted. Um, so we came up with what we call a standby queue. So I can run as, as large of a job as the cluster will, will, will let me start, um, but I can only run it for four hours. So the faculty knows that, that, that if their node is being borrowed, they'll get what they've paid for within, within a couple of hours, and the, and the people who are doing the borrowing know that they can count on four-hour chunks in which to get extra computation done. So that's just free for, for people then? It's free for people who are who are partners in the cluster. So the the uh, the the fee, the fee to enter is at least one node. So somebody who who isn't a partner in the cluster doesn't have access to that. Got it. Now, do you do any kind of fair share scheduling with that to to prevent abuse? Like one guy who buys one node and then continually submits 500 node jobs in the standby queue for the next three years. Yeah, currently we do occasionally see some users that do that, and I think that's just a virtue, uh, by virtue of us of our batch system. Currently, we're using PBS Pro on our clusters, which doesn't give us the ability to fair share within one single queue. We can do it across the entire cluster, but then not necessarily within the queue. We are we are in the process of moving to Moab on our Carter cluster, our newest one, and it does give us that capability. So you mentioned there a number of uh, things that d d they're really only paying for the nodes, and you're picking up a lot of the other costs. I'm curious from the other panelists what costs you have to cover and which costs are kind of offered as a public good. Brian, let's start with you on this one. Yeah, well, I think we're probably a little bit different in the sense that we are um, explicitly funded by Ohio's Board of Regents. Uh, so we are a, uh, and we always have been, you know, we're in our 25th year now, a shared resource for the state. Um, so there is no no cost to enter for any of our users. Um, uh, basically, they just they come to us and ask for resources, and, and we hand them out. So um, there's no you know there, there there's no no sort of cost to pass on to any of our users. Now, some of our users do volunteer to uh, help pay for some licenses uh, or some storage if they're exceptionally large users. Um, but um, you know you you could be a, a tiny user using a tiny amount of resources, and, and you'll pay the same amount of zero dollars as, as our largest users uh, do. 
Okay. Andy, what do you guys do in Michigan? So uh, for, for we have uh, the mandate. In fact, we, we are, I guess, the total opposite of, of what Brian is doing in Ohio. Uh, we have the mandate of recovering every cost. Um, we have zero extra funding. So we, uh, we have to cover um, people pay. Uh, we have a we have a rate that we set, and um, we have an internal university, as, as everyone does, I'm sure. It's kind of fake money. Uh, you can have an account. I guess it's real at some point, but uh, uh, and you can give us your account number, and we will charge that for for what you ask for. And uh, we are obligated to recover all of the costs for the staff, the data center, the networking, the compute nodes, the software. Um, we we cannot spend. We we did get some seed capital, as it were, so we could get going. Um, but we are not allowed to spend anything that we cannot then recoup. So uh, that's, that it's, I, I would not recommend that model, by the way, to anyone listening. I think it's, it's a very difficult model. <laughs> and it's unlike many other research things where, you know, when you show up in your office as a researcher, you flip the lights on and they come on. You don't, you don't get a bill for that. Um, so it's very hard for people to come to grips with the fact that they have to pay for every single thing. Um, unlike when you go to the grocery store where, you know, most human beings go to the grocery store and you do pay for everything you buy. So uh, it's a different academia in that way is, is weird, but we're, we're trying to, uh, I guess here at Michigan, look like we are more like a grocery store, uh, where when you walk out with a bag of chips and you know, a six-pack of pop, you, uh, you have to pay for both those things, and that's the way it is on our cluster. So just curious, do you even have to prorate things like power and HVAC and whatnot? So if I ran a job on two nodes for two hours, you've got some kind of formula for how much that costs in power and air conditioning and things too? Uh, yes, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, we don't wow. charge you by the hour, but we do charge you by the minimum. Our minimum allocatable unit is one core for one month. So if you say, I would like one core for one month, we will charge you somewhere around $20 for that. Um, and then in that $20 is, in fact, the HVAC and power. And that's right. Yeah, so you know, it's, it's an interesting uh, discussion, the idea of, of, of trying to recoup all your costs. And, and I will add from our perspective that even being a state-funded resource is not exactly easy, especially in the current uh, economic climate. You know, our budgets have been flat for, for quite a while. And so uh, it's a scrape, you know, to get uh, the resources that we need uh, in play for our users. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's one of the things that, that we're – looking at is, is additional ways to, to get some uh, money into the center to pay for staff time and, and capital expenditures and, and, and things like that. And, and it's a fact, as a matter of fact, we, we do uh, sell some usage of our time to, to commercial entities. Um, and so we have a, a rate card that, you know, defines a, a CPU hour cost and, and we can bill our users for that. And that uh, presumably covers uh, hardware, you know, capital expenditures, uh, operating costs of the hardware and staff time as well. So, Preston, how do you guys do the costs there at Purdue? So, we're, we're, we're actually, it sounds like we're kind of right, right in the middle in, in, between, in between those ends of the spectrum. The spectrum. Uh, for the faculty, the, all, all that they're paying is the cost of, of the node, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but we, we, do, um, we do fully cost everything else. Um, we do, the, in, in, our, in our total cost of ownership calculation, we do include the power, the, the data center space, the staff time. So we know how much the true cost is to the institution, and um, as, as I heard just a second ago, for for external customers like from private industry, we do use that as, as a rate to build them for access to this program. But we don't we don't fully take that same amount of of, uh, of, of cost from the faculty. I have to say, in fairness, that when I say f fully costed, we do get a lot of uh, benefits from being being in the you know broad embrace of the University of Michigan. So I, I think that if we were to look at a commercial cost, um, it would be hard for us to say this is the true total cost, depreciation of buildings, those kinds of things we, are, we, don't, we don't worry about too much, um, which we would have to do, of course, if we were going to do a, a true total cost of ownership for this stuff. But, so there, there are some areas where we have our hands. But the things that we buy on a short time horizon of years, not decades, uh, we do attribute all the costs somehow. And, and then we charge them to people. So, Brian, um, why don't you start covering the question of what do you do with the two different types of users? What do you do with the user who has a consistent need? They're running, say, 100 cores worth of stuff nonstop versus a user who wants 1,000 cores, say, every other month. That's 
that's actually an excellent question. Um, we, because we do have both types of those users, obviously. Uh, what we will sometimes do is uh, we'll set up reservations uh, so that the um, nodes will be held available for a user who, who will typically have a consistent amount of usage um, so that they continue to get that kind of usage. Uh, what we, you know, we're in a situation right now where we are running almost at capacity almost all the time. Uh, so we're trying to avoid setting up too many reservations on our new cluster. Um, you know, we're still running our, our old cluster, Glenn, and we still have some reservations on that. Uh, but we could, we just really don't want to have a situation where users are um, holding nodes, not getting charged for their use, and pulling them out of the pool for everybody else. But we, we do occasionally set up reservations uh, for some users. Um, this actually happens uh, more often for commercial users where they have a, uh, uh, a certain time frame to get some work done. Uh, and, and of course, they're they're paying us, whereas our other users are are not directly paying us. They're paying us through their tax money, I guess. But uh, um, so so we do we do a little bit of that. We do a little bit of queue priority sometimes uh, for some folks. Um, and and uh, those are, I think are the two things that we do most often to uh, kind of get away from the normal usage. So Preston, how do you handle those two different types of use cases? Right. We, we, we really don't differentiate in terms of, of, how, of how we operate for, for, either, for either use case. Um, we just, uh, we just give, give them the ability to, to acquire computing, and if it's appropriate for them to, um, to use it that way, if, like if they run a lot of jobs and get a lot of value for it, then great. If they don't, get, if they don't run the entire time, then, then it just, they just don't get it. They just don't get all the, all the bang for their buck, so to speak. So it's really up to them. So how does that work in with, you know, researchers have to buy, you know, whole nodes? Do they have, if they really have sporadic use, are their machines basically just idle, even though they paid for them? Yeah, they, they work out that, that does work out that way. But what the, the nice thing is that most of the people that operate in, in a real bursty mode where they don't need computation very often, they're oftentimes the, the faculty that may be buying one or two nodes and just using it sometimes, which for, for spending $3,000 spread out over five years isn't, isn't really a ton of money. The people that are, that are putting in large sums of money buying 50 to 100 nodes, those, those are never the groups that, that let them sit idle all the time. So for the people that have bursty, have, have bursty needs, the, the investment is pretty minimal, and it, and it seems to work out fairly well for them in practice. Hey, Andy? Yeah, so um, the, the model that we have, which is sort of this two-dimensional time and cores model, um, it, it meets some amount of bursty needs, right? If, you're, if you need 1,000 cores for a month, um, we can do that. I'll talk about how in a minute. Um, if you just need a baseline of 100 cores forever, that's very easy for us. Of course, it's predictable. Um, if you need something less than that, say you need 1,000 cores for a day, you'd, you would end up paying us for a month, and that, that would be unattractive to you probably. Um, it's still cheaper than buying 1,000 cores from, from a hardware vendor for a day. So we have a bit of an advantage there. But even so, we're, we're looking at other ways to accommodate the very, very short, very, very large jobs, um, which we have not figured out, by the way. Um, the, our, our mission or our, our dream, I guess, is that if we have 10 people who all want to run big, huge jobs over a short period of time, we, we can multiplex them together and take good advantage of the hardware without ending up with a ton of hardware sitting around idle waiting for these big jobs to come. Um, I, I think we're headed in a pretty good direction on that. It feels to me like like we might be able to actually do that. Um, but like I said, we're still in the early stages of this, only a couple of years in, so we'll see how, how it goes as we uh, as we add more users and the system gets larger. But the, but the general idea is that you, you, you can pay for whatever you want up to the size of the system, and then our, our issue is make sure the system is big enough and can sustain itself at that size to accommodate those kinds of requests. Does that, that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Let me ask, a, this is not directly related, but it's kind of pseudo-related. Pseudo um, for the guys who said that you do have some idle capacity sometimes, do you ever power down nodes? And, and there's at least two variables to that, Ron, right? Is, uh, is it worth it power-wise to power them down? Do you actually get any cost savings? And number two, is it worth it mechanically to, you know, spin down the drives and spin them back up and things like that? Or does that 
shorten the life of the machine and things like that. So, Andy, I'm going to throw this back to you. Uh, sure. We um, we don't do that at present. We have investigated it. I, I think we probably will get there um, because I, I do think that the power savings for us will be noticeable. Um, we're doing some, some also some work in some data center stuff, which should reduce our power costs, which then might not make it worthwhile. We just leave them on all the time. But um, we do have – just recently we've come into some idleness um, – and we've been getting closer to looking at powering things on. We would do it in an automated way. Uh, we run Moab and Torque here, and they have a sort of add-on product that would that supports doing that. Um, and that's what we're looking at using to see, see if we can do it. But we've not we've not done it yet. Now, okay, Preston, do you guys have? I, I I seem to recall that you said you have idle time too, or do I have that backwards? Well, we we we, we do have we do have idle time in theory. So if um, if our if a faculty investor isn't using their time, it is in theory available for others to use. In practice, the between the um, the faculty using their dedicated queues and the standby access where where I can borrow my neighbor's queue, the cluster is used about 75 um, 80 percent of the time. Uh, for that extra 20 percent, though, we've we've um, developed a solution where we've created a a very very large condor grid that runs behind all of our clusters. So while PBS primarily schedules the cluster, when the nodes aren't being used by PBS, condor is free to schedule on them. And that condor resource we make available to anybody on campus at no charge. Um, so in practice, when you figure in scavenging those cycles with Condor, we get much, much, much higher utilization um, in, into the 90%. Um, so one way or the other, that idle capacity gets uh, sucked up somewhere. Fascinating. Brian, how about you? Yeah, we you know we don't really have uh, much in the way of idle time at the moment. Um, I actually just checked both of the queues right now while we were talking, and one of the machines is not, I think 95% of the cores are in use, uh, or, excuse me, 95% of the nodes are in use, and uh, the new machine, Oakley, it's 98%. Uh, and this has been pretty consistent for us for about eight months. So uh, we we don't really power things down for power savings. Um, but, you know, we're, we're at a situation where you actually hit the cap uh, for power consumption in our facility. And uh, we had to size our new machine appropriately to fit inside that power limit. Uh, we had to buy something a little bit smaller than we wanted, actually. I think our, I mean our goal would be to never power anything down, is, and to match the you know the demand to the resources accurately as we could. Um, so that that's actually our our primary goal is to do that and and not worry about powering things down. So we've heard a couple of different things. Um, you know, units being a core, units being a node. When it comes to actual scheduling policy and mixing users across stuff, uh, especially you. Brian, with the uh, just giving out the CPU hours, how do you manage an actual queue within these allocations? You use fair share policies or max proc or what kinds of tricks do you do? Yeah, we we actually kind of do all of those things. We we have a, a hard cap on the number of cores. Uh, any one user can be using it at any one time. Um, a hard cap on the number of uh, Actually, the cap happens to be the same on cores uh, for a project. So, uh, you know, all of the jobs in a particular project could be using, I think it's about 2,048 cores at one time. Uh, and we also have caps on the number of jobs per user and jobs per uh, project. Um, and that's just to, you know, avoid any one user sucking up 100% of the resource at any one time. Uh, we also do some fair share. Uh, so, and I, I, you know, I don't remember the exact numbers uh, that we use, but we do do some of that stuff to... Uh, to kind of keep one person from starving too many other people from getting access to courts. Preston, how about you guys at Purdue? Well, at, at Purdue, we allocate it such that each each faculty owner um, gets gets a dedicated queue set up for them with uh, with a max proc limit uh, based on the number of, of cores that they purchase into. So if I buy one 16-core node, I have a queue with a 16 uh, processor max proc. Um, within, within that owner queue, there's really no limits. There's no cap on jobs per user. There's not fair share by default. Um, we do have a couple groups that, that are interested in doing that. Um, within our standby queue, like as I mentioned earlier, as we're, as we're moving our clusters to Moab, we are, going to, we are going to set it up so that it is fair shared within, uh, within that standby queue. 
Yeah, so here at Michigan for uh, for our allocation based system, um, everybody sort of in a way they self limit, right? They tell us how many cores they want, and that's then how many they can use at any one time. Um, and we do do fair share amongst the groups and users. So um, in the event the system is busy, they're totally full, right? It's 100 percent full, which is the only time that stuff actually comes into play is if there are queued jobs to order. Um, which, like I mentioned at the beginning, our goal is to not ever have very many or any jobs in the queue. We want them to flow through pretty quickly, so hopefully stuff doesn't ever make any difference. But um, within one project, of course, it might. You might have a, a two-core allocation you asked for and, you know, 50 grad students, um, and that would be then very busy. But then we, we do apply fair share within that, so people can have a fighting chance of, of getting their stuff to run. At least uh, no one person can dominate it for a long time. So let's let's go through that same round again, but there was something. Preston, early on you mentioned that you've kind of gone to a service thing like a, a faculty can't find and find a node with their specific name on it, even though that's what they're, they, they paid for a node. Does that mean if they have 16 cores that they can have, if they submitted 16 one-core jobs, they could be running on 16 different nodes? Yeah, that's correct. They'll, they'll, they'll get at least a number of, of cores that they've that they've bought yeah so we, we allocate based on the cores but we but we sell based on nodes but what about something like memory like what if they request they submit 16 one core jobs but each one of those jobs requests the entire memory of a single node um, then in in practice that'll work out that the bat system will only let them get one job through at a time so Andy how do you guys handle that kind yeah. of problem uh, yeah, we sort of do it. Uh, it's, it sounds like in practice the same way that the Preston is is doing it. Um, every the the actual unit that you get is one core and its associated memory. So in our system, that's four gigs of RAM. Um, so if if you say you got a sixteen core allocation and you submitted a one core job, I can't do that math. Man. Let's make it easier. So you got a two core allocation. You submitted a one core job with asking for eight gigs of RAM. You, only that one would start. Um, the second job would wait for that one to finish. So we do count resources both in, in processors and memory in that way. Um, they're not tied to each other explicitly, wherein you can only run four gigs of RAM with one core. But uh, the, sum, the sum of them all has to add up to what you have been allocated. And then, Brian, how do you guys handle this, and how do you charge your CPU hours based on you know excessive resource use other than CPUs? Well, we so we only explicitly charge for CPU usage. Um, so if someone is requesting one core on a machine, but they want all you know 48 gigs of, of RAM on that machine, um, currently they're only going to get charged for that one core. Um, however, you know we, we've got the ability now with Oakley uh, to use containers. Um, now that we're on Red Hat uh, six, I believe. Um, so we're investigating, uh, I think we're probably going to start charging um, basically a, a proportion of the node. Uh, you know, so if you're asking for half of the RAM on the node, you'll get charged for six cores even if you're only using one. And we'll probably do something similar with uh, scratch face on the nodes as well. All right, so just out of curiosity, just to make sure I understood what you guys are saying, you guys actually do, in, in real time, allocate more than one job per node if, if required. So like, uh, let's say I've got a 16 core machine, you could schedule two eight way MPI jobs onto those, onto that machine. Is that correct? So we, we schedule um, serial jobs uh, and we can, so I should perhaps clarify our terminology. We consider any job that stays on one node, a serial job, uh, whether it's one core or uh, you know, all 12 on Oakley. Um, so we'll allow serial jobs to coexist on a node. Uh, so somebody could be using six cores and another person could be using the other six cores. Um, parallel jobs, we require uh, entire node usage. Um, so uh, if you want to run across two, uh, two nodes, uh, we consider that a parallel job. You get charged for use of 24 cores, even if you're only using one core per node. Gotcha. Now, you guys, the other guys, Andy, Preston, do you guys do something similar? Uh, no, we we are purely core allocation. So um, yeah, we could end up if we had uh, we have twelve core nodes right now. So if we had um, twelve twelve way MPI jobs, it is conceivable that um, one task from each MPI job 
would be on one different node, and there'd be then 12 different MPI jobs, one task from each one on a node. Gotcha. Does, does your scheduler attempt to minimize that effect, or is it uh, ignorant of topology stuff like that? Uh, it does. It does try, uh, but it's a good question. You know, and I don't know if it's explicit. It doesn't generally work out that that happens. Um, I don't think the scheduler is that aware of it, but it does try to pack things as tightly as it can in that sense. So we don't we don't see that in practice very often. Um, and we do allow people if they want to. Uh, it might cost them some queue time, but they're, they're allowed to request if they want. I want all 12 of my cores on one node. Um, so if, if, if the, the human interaction by the user uh, can influence that. Yeah, and, and then, at, then at Purdue, we operate the um, we, we operate ours the same way. It's by the core. Um, the scheduler does try to pack them, but if the user wants to spread them out, they're free to do so. Okay, Andy, let's start with you. Why don't you give us uh, three things that you like about your allocation model and three things that you don't like about it? The three, three things that we like about it... Um, so the first thing is uh, we do get pretty good efficiency um, with respect to hardware usage, machine room usage, uh, staff usage for operations especially. So we think that that's, a, that's a quite a nice thing for us. Um, so that's one good thing. Um, the second good thing is we, we one of our original goals years ago, two and a half years, three years ago, when we started thinking about this was we thought the barrier to entry was high for people who may not be computationalists. They might be, though. So we thought, boy, you know, asking somebody to give us a couple thousand dollars and make a three-year commitment just so they could see is is a lot. Um, so we thought, boy, it'd be nice if we had a way that you could come in and try it for just a little while. Uh, so one of our goals was, in fact, to lower the barrier to entry. So, you know, if you have a couple hundred dollars, say you had a hundred dollars, um, you could get five cores for a month. You can run a an MPI job with that, you could you could get some modest work done, and it would cost you a hundred dollars. Um, so that we thought was a, a nice that was a nice way to start for people. Um, so we think that that's quite a nice model, um, a nice feature of our model, I guess. Um, let's see. The third the third good thing, um, boy. Brock, is there a third good thing about our model? <laughs> This is great stuff uh, that we can cut. I don't know. I mean, you already mentioned <laughs> awesome. the utilization stuff, so. So that was, I mean, that was, I guess there are only two good things about our model. Um, and I think that they really are, the, the, the efficiency of it is, we think, is quite high. And we think that we've enabled researchers here at Michigan to to come in um, and give it a try without a big commitment or big expenditure. They don't have to actually own hardware. They don't worry about machine room or rack space. Um, and because of that, we were able to provide a, a fairly richly configured resource, right? It's all InfiniBand. We have uh, quite a bit of, of scratch space using Luster over InfiniBand. So it's, it's things that you could not, even with a medium-sized cluster, you may not get for your own. Um, you have to be at some scale to, to achieve those things at a reasonable cost. So I guess that would be the third good thing about our model is the um, we're able to provide a fairly rich feature set um, at what well, is essentially incremental cost now for people, which is which is nice. Okay, Andy, let me let me interrupt you. Let's go get three from everybody, and then we'll come back and do three bad from everybody. So, Brian, give me give me three good things about your model. So, I think you know, I think from from our perspective as a shared resource center, one of the best things about doing things the way we do is uh, that we keep our utilization very high. Uh, we don't have a lot of um, idle nodes. Um, and, and, and when we do, uh, it's the case that anybody can submit a job and they will run very quickly. So um, looking at the, the kind of user community as a whole, uh, utilization high, wait times are low. Um, kind of a second thing uh, that I like about our, our system is that uh, requests for resources uh, are justified uh, and reviewed um, via that peer review process. And I think that that's a, a nice way to ensure that um, that what we're, we're, we're handing out resources appropriately to, to what their needs are rather than what they think their needs are. Uh, and the third thing that I think is good about this is there's no real barrier to entry. Um, small users, you know, who maybe don't have any money, I, I know we've talked about small amounts of money, but maybe somebody who doesn't have any money can still access these HPC resources that, you know, they don't have to worry about um, purchasing a portion of a cluster or purchasing their own cluster. Um, it, you know, maybe they only need the resource for a short period of time, and they can uh, easily access it uh, with our allocation model. 
Okay, cool. And uh, Preston? So uh, one of the, the, the best things about our model is I think a couple of them center around the cost. Um, since, we, since we do build a community cluster every year, it's a predictable thing for the, for the faculty um, to be able to get computing no matter when their grants may be arriving or when a new faculty member may be starting. And then also because we do this every year, it, um, it realizes some pretty tremendous cost savings to the entire institution. Um, over the years, our, uh, we've negotiated with the vendors to get good prices on the clusters, but then we're also able to use those same configurations and prices for servers in every area of the university. Um, so we can, we've can we saved millions of dollars of in server acquisitions over the last five years. Um, for the uh, for the faculty member, the the barrier to entry is is fairly low. It's not zero, but at the cost of, of only a single node at about two or three thousand dollars, it's it's pretty minimal. So just about anybody can get access to uh, to computing. Okay, and let us flip this question now. You know, what are three bad things about your model? Let's go in the same order again, Andy. Sure. So now that I've had some time to think, uh, I'm, I'm probably going to be better at the bad things. But, but I don't think that's a reflection of my opinion of our model. I'm quite, quite fond of it, actually. Uh, but the three bad things are, one, one is um, we, we have spent a lot of time here at U of M talking to our internal audit group, and we've not yet figured out a way, although we might be getting closer, to accepting grant-funded hardware with the restrictions that come with that. So, um, you know, if your listeners are familiar with the A21 rules, we... Uh, we hew to those quite closely here at Michigan, and uh, that prohibits sharing of hardware if it was purchased on grant money with anybody other than the grant. Um, I think there's some flexibility in interpretation uh, nationwide on that, but uh, the interpretation here is quite strict. So uh, we, because we have a totally shared model, um, like I said, for utilization reasons and efficiency reasons, um, we don't, we can't really take grant-funded hardware into our model. So if your grant funding is hardware specific and not just Claim uh, flexible money, our mo the model doesn't work, and we have condo clusters to address that. Um, so there's that issue. The uh, the second thing I think is uh, our granularity is a core for a month. There's uh, been a lot of interest in people either getting direct bill, pay for what you use, um, or getting a smaller granularity core for a day, for example. Um, that turned out to be fairly complicated for us, uh, but we are working on that as well. Um, People are not going to see the same cost, I'm afraid, and it might be less attractive at that point, but, uh, but the granularity is weird for us in that way. Um, and the last part of the model, which is truly a model thing, it's a financial thing, um, because we are obligated to recover every cost, we are somewhat uh, – uh, things that we cannot charge for or attribute direct costs to, we cannot not put into a rate, and we cannot not recoup their costs. So those are things that we don't do, uh, at least not as part of the – very narrowly scoped model of the hardware. Things like consulting, for example, have to be done outside of it, uh, different funding streams, that kind of stuff. So that makes it a little bit trickier for us in places. Um, we do address that by sort of having a, a stone soup approach to it where we ask everybody to throw in a consultant, and then pretty soon we have a bunch of consultants we can kind of work with. So uh, that does work out for us, but uh, it makes it a little bit challenging because then it's, it's not centrally run. It's, it's very much uh, you know contributor-based. So that's, uh, those are kind of the three, I think, uh, shortcomings of it. So. Okay. Probably some other ones as well I'm not thinking of. So I don't, you know, it's not perfect, but uh, but it's not perfect. Brian? I think, uh, you know, one of the big challenges we have is uh, convincing people who do have resources and funds uh, the value in contributing to a shared resource like OIC. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I think a condo model is much easier to sell to somebody uh, than economies of scale, <laughs> which we can provide, and and the ability to to kind of maintain the shared resource. Uh, you know, if somebody's buying their own cluster in their lab, they have to maintain it, they have to pay for it. Uh, they may not have the expertise to to run the cluster as well as we can, and that's a hard that's a hard sell. It's a hard way to convince people to to kick in money to help us buy bigger bigger clusters. So. Uh, that's a, a challenge for us, and one of the reasons that we're exploring the idea of, of perhaps uh, getting into the condo space. Um, for some individuals, uh, you know, kind of second problem, some individuals' waits may be long, uh, depending on the resources that you're requesting. Uh, if, you, if you need, uh, you know, one of the larger memory nodes or, or GPU access, you know, it's uh, we have like eight nodes with 192 gigs of RAM, I believe as opposed to the 48 on most of our nodes. So those are going to be in higher demand, and the waits to get to those resources are, are longer. 
uh, the weights to get, you know, one in every 10 nodes has a GPU, so the weights to get to the GPUs may be a little bit longer uh, than if you had your own kind of dedicated resource uh, where you asked for that stuff up front and that was always available. And um, yeah, kind of the big, I guess the big white elephant in the room is uh, we haven't talked about disk usage, uh, long-term storage. Uh, that's something that we don't account for at all in our allocation model. Uh, we tend to be very generous in giving out disk space, but um, you know, it's, we found that our users can gobble up the space as fast as we put it out there, and, and uh, that's, that's becoming a real challenge for us. Uh, and, and the usage is different than CPU. CPU is, you know, uh, it's very easy to, to reallocate a CPU to somebody else uh, when it's not being used, but storage is, is kind of perpetually in use. It's, it's a different resource entirely. So um, disk storage is, is just a big problem for us. Indeed. Okay, Preston, how about you? I, 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 uh, I find it interesting that you mentioned the storage because uh, that, that was actually one of the areas I wanted to mention as a challenge for us. Um, where, 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 where our problem lies is we don't currently have um, a provision in our model to do condo storage, um, which is something that our users um, keep coming to us with. If I have X amount of dollars, I, how many terabytes of disk can I get for that? And as of yet, we haven't got the, got the perfect way to do that. So that's definitely a challenge that we're, that we're working towards solving. Um, we don't currently do the, uh, the number of cores times unit of time model yet, even though uh, we do have, a, we, we have in the last couple of months had several years, users asking for it. Um, so we do see that this is a direction that people are going to want to go. Um, so there will have to probably be some future developments in making that part of the model. And then finally, I think that one of the um, one of the uh, the weak points in our model is where it scales to to very very large scale users. We do have many research groups that buy hundreds of nodes on each cluster, uh, and and that, that's great for them when they can when they can use uh, that their entire share of the cluster. But if they want to run something on twice as many nodes as they own, which may be most of the cluster. There's not a reliable way to do that yet. We've, we, we've got to do some more exploring whether we're going to do reservations, have dedicated times where, the, where somebody can do a whole cluster run. And to date, that's really been kind of an ad hoc type of process. So we definitely need to come up with some more um, structured ways of doing that in the future. Okay, everybody. Well, thank you very much for your time. I think a lot of the people who are looking at, you know, starting an allocation thing or combining a couple of research groups together and getting some economies of scale will find this very useful. So again, Andy, Preston, and Brian, thank you very much for your time, and we will have this show up soon. Yeah, thanks, guys. I, I think we could have gone on for another hour here. This is fascinating stuff. Well, if there's if there's response from the uh, from your listener group uh, that that there's more interest, I think I'd, I'd be at least in for doing another hour of it. There you yeah, go. I would too. But I think per your suggestion over the instant messenger, we should do it over beer next time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes everything better, doesn't it? Yes, it sure does. Okay, thanks, guys. <laughs>